Every day we use countless devices that have one form of battery or another, each generating your needed electricity whenever on demand. But what if you had to make your own? What goes on in these little cylinders? And how would you go about recreating that? In this video, I'm looking into the historic origin of the battery to build my own from scratch and see what we can power with it. Let's get started. We first explored the topic of a battery over a year ago when we recreated the supposed Baghdad battery, a 2000 year old ceramic vessel that had surprising similarities to a chemical battery. It's questionable it was ever used as an actual battery, but it proved to be an interesting experiment. Fast forward 1700 years and humanity first began to explore the fascinating world of electricity. In our last video, we recreated early devices to generate and store static electricity and created what was likely called the first electric battery, the Leiden jar, which could store a high voltage charge about 50 years later, Italian physicist Alessandro Volta explored a different type of electricity, current electricity, where rather than a single high voltage discharge, you have a continuous flow of electricity. By stacking two different types of metal in an alternating pile, he found you could generate a continuous source of electrical current in what was the first true battery, the voltaic pile. This battery operates more or less the same concept as the Big Dad battery and also your classic lemon battery. Except there's one metal we can add this time that will greatly improve our results, and that's zinc instead of iron. In one of our recent videos, we explored some of the early smelting methods of zinc used by ancient Romans. However, these only resulted in the copper zinc alloy of brass. Actually separating zinc as its own element was a little bit more of a complex endeavor, not mastered until around the 13th century in India. In the 18th century, William Champion took inspiration from Indian methods and brought zinc smelting to the West. Basically, we're distilling it. So when you smelt zinc, it turns into a gas, and if you don't capture it, you're just gonna lose it. So now it's time to kind of try and replicate it as best as possible. And uh, the key thing for it is basically they have a crucible with a pipe going down. Piece of crucible here, and they have the blowpipe for a glass blowing. You repurpose it for this, and have a hole that'll fit the pipe. I'm going to have top like that. And then below, it'll sit inside the bowl of water. It'll heat up, it'll turn into a gas, and it'll be unable to escape out of the crucible, so it will go down through the tube into the water, which will then cool it as a solid metal. So there's a chance the gas will escape on the edge of the crucible. It's a fairly tight fit, so I think I think we'll be pretty good. But to test this out, I'm gonna first do it with an electric modern kiln, just to make sure we reach the right temperature and make sure our setup is all good. And then we can repeat it once again using charcoal. First, we gotta build kind of a platform for this crucible to sit on and then be heated on. The pipe will go down into, into the water and we need it to be insulated because we don't want the water to boil when all the heat is applied above. Use some of the bricks from the kiln and put them together and let's test it out. So I was able to do the first test run of the zinc smelt and the results are not super promising. Peeking inside the kiln, I could see the yellow residue that was on pretty much everything. The zinc ore was escaping the crucible and leaking out of the edges of it here, covering it with the zinc compound on top of everything. Overall, this process was never really the most efficient. Today, we do the electrolysis because it's much more efficient. That said, we do have something in the solution here. You need a little bit better airtight seal on our crucible if we want this to work. So I think I'm gonna try loading up the crucible again with more ore, and this time I'm gonna try sealing it with just clay. His method was not very efficient, but after doing a few test batches with the electric kiln and then a more historical one using charcoal, I was able to collect enough particles to make at least one disc of zinc but we'll need a few more for our battery as well as an equal number of discs of copper. I'm gonna use the lost wax casting method. I'm gonna use this chisel to pull away some of the clay to make room for the wax. And then when we melt the wax out, it'll be the perfect hole for the copper. Easy does it. Nice. Boop. The method we're using is what the Chinese use to make coins. So it's kind of like a coin tree. Pour the copper in and it goes down into all the different coins. So it'll work for our disc. In order to do that, I need to make the channel. So I'm gonna do that. Love it. Gotta be 
this big. Okay. All right, we got our three casts. Gonna melt out the wax once they're dry and then fill them up with copper and zinc. All right, so then between each of the uh, the metals, we need some sort of electrolyte. And to hold the electrolyte, which in our case is gonna be brine, we're going to make some felt. Which is really simple. We have some sheep wool, we'll add some soapy water, just kind of agitate it. The hairs have kind of little hooks on them. If you agitate them enough, they all kind of combine together into interlock and form a solid piece. And then we just cut it out to the size you need and soak them in salt water. But first, thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. If you feel like you need to speak to someone or you just need a mental health check-in, BetterHelp is an amazing online resource that allows you to do just that. It's an online therapeutic resource that sets your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, all from the comfort of your home. People often forget that mental health is just as important as physical health. I know I do. To get started, head to betterhelp.com slash htme, answer a few questions about your state of mind, and before you know it, you'll be matched with a licensed therapist who will work with you. It takes about as much effort as watching a YouTube video to start your connection to BetterHelp. BetterHelp is about facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists as needed. Head to betterhelp.com slash htme to answer a few questions and get paired up with a therapist. Oh yeah, and you'll also get 10% off your first month when you click that link below. With all of our metal ready, we paid a visit to a local museum to see some historic examples of voltaic piles. We're at the uh, Bakken Museum today, and more specifically, we're in the artifact vault um, of the Bakken Museum. My name is Adrian Fisher. I'm the curator of exhibits and collections at the Bakken Museum. The first battery is actually this piece. This is called a voltaic pile. It was uh, invented by Alessandro Volta. Alessandro Volta and Luigi Galvani kind of had a, a debate over what kind of electricity it is that you have in your body because it was discovered that there's something electric about the body. Volta. In hindsight, he was right. Um, he said that it's the same electricity as you see when you have lightning, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he invented this voltaic pile, essentially consists of um, zinc and copper plates consecutively stacked on top of each other. And you have cardboard or cloth in between. And to get it operating, you soak the whole thing in brine, essentially. And then it creates a current electricity. So it's a flow of electricity. It's very different from what you would get from a Leiden jar. The Leiden jar produces a sudden discharge, mm -hmm. um, which makes it so painful. This electricity, current electricity, is continually flowing. And this was very important. Um, the voltaic pile was essentially responsible for bringing chemistry um, um, into being because with the current electricity you can now break up compounds of materials. We used to have um, an exhibit that actually broke down water in hydrogen and oxygen um, using electricity, right, and then combining it again and lighting it up and it would explode, right. Uh. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Now to put together our battery and see what we can power. Should have everything now to put together our voltaic pile. We have 13 copper discs, 13 zinc discs, and then felt layers to go in between. Then it's just a process of stacking them, alternating between with the felt in between. It'll basically be the battery. Add 
battery. I had some uh, thin pieces of brass here to act as basically our wires, and I think we're ready to turn our battery on. Pour salt water on it, and our battery is a battery. Not sure what we'll get out of it, but we can do a few different tests. Measure with a voltmeter, try out an LED light, see if we can just get a spark between them. But yeah, this has potential for generating some decent amount of electricity. All right, so I did a little bit of troubleshooting and uh, should be doing a couple things a little bit different to get better results. We only need felt between each cell. Each cell can just be touching itself directly. So we need about half as many felt. And then some of them might've been a little bit thick. So I got some thinner pieces here. They'll probably be uh, a little bit better. And then instead of using just salt water, I'm gonna use a combination of salt and vinegar to create an even stronger brine. All right, we're looking at 8.75 volts, I believe. Actively dropping. 8.7 volts from the stack, pretty good. Say about 40 milliamps, not too bad. One of the big doors that the battery opened up is electrolysis. I first discovered with the electrolysis of water. So we have here is a solution. It's got a little bit of lye in it just to kind of help uh, acts electrolyte, otherwise you need a lot of power to uh, run it through just pure water. You need a, a little bit over a volt, ideally, to overcome the, the bonds in water. And we have more than that here. So one of the downsides of the voltaic pile is that it uh, kind of a little inconsistent and starts to degrade fairly quickly. So we have a bit of lead, we have two test tubes here that are filled. If this works, you should get hydrogen in one and oxygen in the other. Fill it four volts. It's dropped a lot, but we should have enough. All right, so here we have a demonstration of electrolysis of water. And in chemistry, this is kind of a game changer. Most chemistry is about achieving equilibrium and lower power states. So there's a lot of reactions that just are pretty much impossible to reverse until you supply with an excess of electricity. Then suddenly you can break down compounds that were previously not known to be compound. Probably the best example is water in kind of classical knowledge. That was one of the main elements. The water is actually made up of two components and when they're broken down into one into each tube and you can even tell the ratio where this one has twice as much volume as this one. You can kind of deduce what these elements are, put a match to this and it should explode. And then the other one is just oxygen. The voltaic pile is the very first battery and very powerful in terms of kind of what you can do with it. You can pretty easily scale up because you have a bunch of different cells. So the factors that go into it is basically each cell, you're stacking the amount of voltage, but to increase the amount of amperage is based on the surface area of each cell. So if we want to charge something, requires a little bit more power, like say a modern cell phone, we need a, a fair amount of surface area. I have here a store-bought stack of copper and zinc. So I should be able to stack these together and hopefully get enough amperage to charge a cell phone. The actual cost of buying all this metal was about $150. So this is gonna be a $150 battery that is probably not gonna charge for too long. Let's see if anything happens. All right, so I think uh, running into issues here that are just discharging too quick. Very hard to either to actually uh, hold the charge. So we have a dissected battery pack, batteries removed, and we're connecting our battery directly to it. This should hopefully kind of correct for the variable voltages. Phone right now is at 19%. See if we can get a little bit higher. Let's start stacking these plates. We do not have any voltage. That is really weird. This might have been shorting out by how thin the paper was between it. So we've got quadruple thickness. Back to zinc. Holy shit. I think we're charging. Look at that. We are charging. We have success. We are charging with my homemade battery. All right. Let's see how far we can get. We're up to 16 already. It's dead. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I got 1% out of that. So charging a cell phone has been kind of the goal for each of the batteries we make. Start with the big dead battery. Has not had much luck. Batteries are just not quite as stable, but some of these later ones 
will hopefully be. So after this was the Daniel cell and then the lead acid battery. It was also very useful. That one is notable because you can recharge it and use it again and again, whereas these are just kind of spent once the metal is used up. The voltaic pile was very groundbreaking, opened the door for electrochemistry and uh, furthering our understanding of electricity. Very notable invention, some use, but was quickly replaced by something better. Thank you again to all of our supporters on Patreon. Without you, this won't be possible. If you like our content, consider supporting us. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.